Why is there concern with groundwater bores? Our view of groundwater quality has changed. Um, and we generally look at uh, water quality in terms of microbiological contaminants and chemical contaminants. In relation to what we're talking about now, our concern is microbiological contaminants. And, and what we've found is that we, we used to consider that groundwater didn't change much. If it was if it was old one day, it would be the same age the next. And what we found is is that groundwater does change a lot more than we thought it did. Um, if you get a big rainfall event or some kind of change, you might find that it's quite a lot younger the next day. The, the problem with that is that the younger the water is, the more likely it is to have viable microorganisms like bacteria or viruses um, in it. Uh, put simply, those organisms can be washed off the soil into the ground, into the groundwater, and and then when you abstract that groundwater for a water supply, those organisms can be in the groundwater. Is that the only way that groundwater would get contaminated? It's not the only way. So the first thing is that when you abstract groundwater, um, if you have a a borehead that's not what we call a sanitary borehead. Sometimes surface water can leak down the side of the bore and and so it can get into the groundwater or into the bore that way. Or if you've got the bore in a chamber below ground, the chamber can fill and water can get in through there. But um, once it's abstracted, it's always at risk within the distribution system. So so if it's in a storage tank, you can get um, rats or birds can get into that storage tank um, and contaminate the water. Um, you, you know, you can get water leaking in through the roof of a tank. Um, birds might be on the roof and that would carry in. You know, people tend to think that the the system itself um, is kind of clean. You're saying perhaps it might not be. We know that water systems um, aren't always all that clean. And, and, and so there's the sources of contamination that I just talked about, but also there's um, what we call pipe films and um, biofilms. And that's a layer of microorganisms that uh, grow on the inside of a pipe. And they can harbour um, organisms that are pathogens or things that can make people sick. And, and the insides of pipes are, are generally not very clean. You always want clean water to be going into the distribution system. Uh, you, if you put clean water into a distribution system, you've got a better chance of getting clean water out of it. Uh, the water standards are changing and uh, the preferred approach seems to be both UV and chlorine for disinfecting public water supplies. So uh, is it possible to have a safe and compliant drinking water supply without using permanent chlorination? Um, so, so the first thing is that standards... Uh, always change, and they change because the science changes, um, and technology changes, and and our knowledge changes, and so they have to keep up with um, uh, the latest thinking and, and and international best practice. And and the problem with water supplies is that the the, the thing that makes them so good that you can get clean water to a whole lot of people in a very short period of time is also the thing that makes them so much at risk because if the water is contaminated you can get contaminated water to a lot of people very quickly. The second part of the question is, um, can you have a water supply that doesn't have a chlorine residual? And, and, and the simple answer, in spite of what I've just said, is that yes, you can. And, and we know that that's the case because uh, some parts of the world, they do that very, very successfully. Um, and and the, the best example in my experience is Denmark. And, and, and Denmark is a country that has um, never used chlorine. Um, and has a whole lot of water supplies that don't use chlorine. The important thing, though, is to look at how they do it. And there's quite a lot of things that are quite different. So I guess the short answer is yes, you can do it. But if we're going to do that, uh, we need to make sure that we follow international best practice and uh, the place to look for it is Denmark and we should really see what they do in Denmark and do what they do. Water suppliers need to weigh up um, the cost, um, how long it would take, how um, achievable it is. Um, and they need to look at those other models and, and figure out what would be the cost in terms of dollars and time. For more information, including an article on the costs of non-chlorinated alternatives, head to tasman.govt.nz forward slash feedback. Consultation closes Friday, September 4. Drinking water supply is an essential service and it's something we just don't think about until uh, there's a problem and, and we need to go back to the history of 
drinking water supplies and why we um, have them. And, and we go back to the days uh, of massive cholera outbreaks with hundreds of people dying uh, from contaminated water supplies, um, you know, to typhoid outbreaks where the same thing occurred. And, and we easily forget um, that that's where we've come from. Um, and and we, we, it's very easy to become very complacent about the safety of our water supplies. Um, but we need to be very, very sure that um, we understand why we need safe water supplies, where we've come from, and that it's a process of, of constant improvement um, and, and constantly making sure we're doing the right thing because that the consequences of contaminated water supply distributed to communities, as we've seen in Havelock North, are really severe.